okay so we're going to look at uh, this question uh, this paper so this is uh, 2017 um, biology paper 2 uh, that is a uh, general certificate yeah so uh, we can start we'll look at uh, section B uh, this is section A yeah, we'll look at section A and uh, we see how best we can uh, go about this all right so the first question part a compute the table 1.0 showing parts of the microscope and their functions all right so this is what we have then we have the part this side then the function on the right hand side so we have the first one uh, so the part is unknown the function is that it collects and uh, reflects light on two spacemen on the stage. So what do you think collects and uh, reflects light onto the spacemen on the stage? So the one that is actually responsible for collection and reflection of light is the mirror. So for this one, the answer should be mirror. So it's the one that is responsible. The second part, the diaphragm. So what is the function of the diaphragm? So the diaphragm actually, it controls the amount and uh, brightness of light. Okay, that is falling on the specimen. So the diaphragm, it uh, controls um, the amount and brightness. Okay, so saying it controls the amount and brightness brightness of light that is falling on the specimen so now the light we're interested in is the one that is uh, falling onto the specimen right so I hope this is okay uh, let's look at the other one so the part is unknown then the function is that it magnifies the image further so what is responsible for magnifying the image so when you look at the parts and the function of the microscope the one that is responsible for magnifying the image is the eyepiece so here we say eyepiece right uh, proceed let's look at uh, the other part so the part the stage what is the function of the stage so the stage the stage is just uh, the part it's a part where we would say a part or a place where the specimen is uh, is actually placed so uh, the function of the stage is to to keep to hold so we can say this is the part uh, where the specimen is placed so the part uh, where the specimen is placed so that is the stage right then the last one the function is that it brings the image into sharp focus especially when the specimen is being viewed at high magnification so the one that is responsible for bringing the image into sharp focus is what we call the fine adjustment knob or fine adjusting knob so you can say this is the fine adjusting knob. So this is the one now that is responsible now for bringing the image into sharp focus. All right. Hopefully uh, you've gotten one or two here. We can proceed to look at uh, the other question. Oh, this is part B now. So part B, we are saying state three parts of a plant cell which can be easily seen under a light microscope. 
So basically, when you're looking at microscopes, there is uh, what we call an electron microscope and a light microscope. So when we look at a light microscope, we are looking for those features that can be easily seen, not the details one. So one of the features that you ever see by any microscope is uh, the nucleus. So the nucleus is one of them. Okay. Then the other feature that you can see is uh, what we call the cell wall. So that one you can uh, see it. Then uh, the third one we can put is a vacuum. So these you can see them using a light microscope. So the vacuum. Then an electron microscope would see those uh, sensitive uh, features, those that are very minute, like the goji bodies, the endoplasmic reticulum, all those uh, would be seen under an electron microscope. But we're looking at a light microscope, so we concentrate on those uh, that uh, can be easily seen. Yes, so that's how best uh, we can go about that. We're going to proceed. Look at another question. Okay, so there we have we have question two. We are done with uh, question one. We proceed. We go to question two. So figure two point one and uh, two point two show two endocrine glands labeled P and Q respectively. So this topic is coming from uh, or this question is coming from uh, a topic uh, called endocrine system. So uh, at your free time, we should maybe look at. Uh, uh, some notes on this topic and uh, you are going to get a full understanding So we have uh, two endocrine glands. So we have figure 2.1 and figure 2.2 Now let's see what they are trying uh, to ask us So the first question is they want us to identify the endocrine glands P and Q So we identify P and Q So what do you think P is and uh, what do you think uh, Q is? So how can we identify those? How can we identify P and uh, how can we identify Q? Alright, so let's start. So P here is uh, what we call the adrenal gland. So the name of P is uh, called the adrenal gland. Hopefully you are able to see the letters. So we have uh, P and Q. So I'm saying P is called the adrenal gland. Adrenal gland. Then uh, what of uh, Q? Q, if you check, now Q is the pancreas. Q is the, the pancreas. So let me come here. Then I write uh, Q. Q is the pancreas. So you just have to know, so these I can just know them by looking at them, I would know to say this is uh, the what, this is the what. So you should be familiar with uh, the topic called endocrine system. So Q is the pancreas. Then we proceed to look at, uh, to looking at the other part of the question. So part two, state one hormone produced by each gland. So hormone produced by gland P. So we have said uh, P is uh, the adrenal gland and uh, the hormone that is produced by the adrenal gland is the hormone called adrenaline. So here we say adrenaline is the one that is produced by the adrenal gland. Then the hormone produced by gland Q is, uh, um, okay, so there are, Basically, you, uh, I'm just going to put one, but uh, I'm going to put insulin. So I'm going to put insulin as the hormone which is produced by the pancreas. But I also want you to know that the pancreas also produces glucagon. Glucagon is also a hormone. So here I'm just going to put uh, insulin. So, But glucagon is also produced by uh, this gland. So you can put uh, whichever, either insulin or or glucagon. Okay, so we proceed. We look at uh, the other one. 
uh, explain how the hormone produced by gland P stated in uh, A2 above plays a role in coordination. Right, so P we've said that's the adrenal gland and we've said the hormone that is produced is the, the adrenaline. So what does the, the adrenaline do? Right, so the main function of the adrenaline is that it converts glycogen to glucose. So the adrenaline converts glycogen to glucose. So meaning if there is a, a low level of glucose in the body, the adrenaline will come into play and it's going to convert the glycogen to glucose thereby increasing glucose levels in the blood to be used that it can be used for gut to the muscles so that is uh, actually the role of uh, of that right so you also have to know the uh, we're looking at the, its role in uh, coordination yeah so it also it is also involved in uh, dilating the eyes of the pupil so the pupils, it can dilate the pupils in the eyes. So if you check out on uh, sensory organs, you'll find that the eye is one of the organs and uh, there is a part in the eye that we call the pupil. So now, dilation in the pupil can also be induced by uh, the same hormone. Okay? Right, so that is a thing. So we are saying adrenaline can be used so I, I let me write something here um, so we're saying the adrenaline now that is produced by the grand P now we are saying it uh, converts uh, glycogen into glucose so uh, it converts glycogen glucose that's the adrenaline so it can convert glycogen to glucose so when glycogen has been converted to glucose meaning sugar levels are being increased so we're saying thereby uh, increasing sugar levels in blood so thereby increasing sugar levels in the blood right so so now that sugar sorry the the the, the, was is the sugar levels now that will be increased so it's going to be used now so it will be used for other functions so basically uh, that's what uh, the adrenaline do okay then we look at the other part of the question explain the other role uh, played by grand Q apart from producing hormones okay so now what did we say uh, about uh, grand Q so we've said it's a pancreas Yes, and uh, we also looked at, uh, if I take you back, so we're looking at gland Q, we've said it's a pancreas and it is responsible for producing what we call uh, this insulin, alright, and uh, glucagon. So this is what we said. Then, now we're saying apart from producing hormones now the hormones that we have mentioned now what else is uh, produced or what's, what else is uh, done by the pancreas so apart from producing hormones i want you to know that uh, the pancreas also assists or it plays a role in uh, digestion how by secreting pancreatic trees so i so we can say the other row so we'll say plays a row 
that plays a role in digestion. So it plays a role in digestion. How? So by so secreting pancreatic trees. Yeah, so now this uh, pancreatic trees, it uh, contains an enzyme now. So it contains an enzyme that we call amylase. So it's called pancreatic amylase. Now, what's the role of this uh, enzyme? So the role of this enzyme, it is to break down starch into maltose. So basically, we are saying the other role is in digestion and uh, it uh, secretes what we call pancreatic trees now in that same pancreatic trees that is uh okay so with this cast space so i can say uh, by secreting pancreatic trees now this trees contains so we can say which contains eh, pancreatic amylase so it's an enzyme that we call pancreatic amylase you can call it amylase um all right yeah so this uh, pancreatic amylase is the one now that is responsible now for breaking down starch into maltose so it's the one that is responsible for breaking down starch into maltose so that is the other row apart from secreting hormones that's the other row of uh, the pancreas All right so we can proceed we look at another another question so here we have question three okay so we seem to have uh, a question on muscles so this is actually coming from uh, uh, a topic that we call uh, the skeletal system so Figure 3.0 shows the muscles in a bent limb in a grasshopper. So we have um, some muscles. So we have uh, R and S. Okay. Then they are saying identify muscles R and S. So what do you think is the muscle R and uh, the muscle S? Now look at. So the muscle which is on top is uh, called flexor muscle so that one is called the flexor muscle so then the one which is down is uh, the one that we call the extensor muscle so this is called uh, the extensor muscle okay so let me just write extensor muscle yes so now it's these they actually work hand in hand um, they work at the very same time and uh, they do opposite uh, uh, jobs such as uh, one relaxes then the other one contracts so that is uh, how they so he, from here you should be able to identify which one relaxes and which one contracts so um let us see so we've said r is the flexor muscle then s is the extensor muscle so let's see the other part they're saying in order to straighten the limb what happens to muscle r and s so since we've said r is the flexor muscle so in order to straighten the limb r is going to relax so muscle r so this one is going to relax then muscle s it will contract so while least one relaxes the other one contracts so this one will contract so that is what you're supposed to know so now i've said they do opposite roles so they, they've got a special term that we call them i think there is a question on that Say so the term used to refer to the action of muscle r and s 
where when one relaxes, the other one contracts. So the term is uh, called antagonistic. So the term is called antagonistic. So in fact, they are called antagonistic muscles. But uh, since we are just looking for a term, uh, that is an action. So we can say antagonistic action. So the term we can use that is the antagonistic action. So they are working antagonistically. Where one relaxes, the other one contracts at the very same time. Okay. So now we proceed. We look at another question. Okay. So here they are saying identify the type of skeleton shown in figure 3.0. So the, the type of uh, skeleton now. If you check it out here, it's an outward. So the type of skeleton we're looking at is the one which is outside. So uh, it's called an exoskeleton. Now an exoskeleton is a type of skeleton that is not, that is outside. Yes, so it's not inside. So there is an, uh, there are what we call an exoskeleton and an endoskeleton. So the type of skeleton that is shown there is called an exo. So exoskeleton. Exoskeleton. Okay. We proceed. We look at another question. State three functions of the skeleton in figure 3.0. Now what do you think is the function of the skeleton? So generally... All skeletons have got similar functions. So, but specifically for this question, so one of the functions of uh, the skeleton is uh, to give a uh, shape. So, one of the function is uh, to give shape. So, the skeleton will actually give the shape. We are actually able to identify uh, the grasshopper because of uh, the skeleton. Okay, the other factor we can uh, we can put like the other function of the skeleton is uh, to provide support. So apart from giving shape, it provides support. So to provide support. So so that means um, so in here. So we're saying without the, the skeleton, there won't be any upright posture. So the skeleton also is there because we're looking at muscles in the skeleton. So the skeleton is the one that is responsible to also provide support. Okay. Then it also uh, supports movement. So, so it provides support. Like in terms of standing, then also for movement is the one uh, it supports movements as well. So we can say, or we can say it provides an attachment to muscles. We can put that one. So we can say it provides a knee attachment. So muscles will actually attach. Uh, so attachment. So I want this one. Of muscles so it actually provides an attachment of muscles so now uh, you find that uh, when muscles are relaxing and uh, contracting so they are actually finding a place like uh, on the skeletons that's why they'll be able to like uh, act on and they'll be able to move from one place to the other so it supports uh, movement provides uh, can give the shape so all those are functions of the skeleton so those are the three functions that you put so we look at uh, the other one so there's another question here that is uh, question five that's the question on genetics all right so now uh, this question had uh, uh, okay we skipped a question anywhere. Let me just check. Hopefully, we've not 
skipped any question okay 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 well, well. let me see so we have that that was question what we are from answering That was question three. Then uh, there is question four that I, I am unable to see here. Yeah, I'm not very sure, but so okay, we can do question five. Then I think uh, we'll look at question four because uh, here it's like the numbers are moving direct from three to five. So now let's do question five then we'll check out for question four again so let's look at question five so question five is a question on uh, genetics so let's see what the question is demanding of us so the question is saying a pure breeding black bull was crossed with a pure breeding red cow then we are saying all the resulting offspring were black so using letter B, or capital B or small b for areas, which area was dominant for skin color? So which one do you think was dominant? So the, the one which was uh, dominant here, because we are saying uh, a, a black bull, which was, uh, so looking at the pure breed, was crossed with a pure breeding red cow. So now look at the offsprings. You discover that all the offsprings were what? Were black. So this simply means the one which was dominant was the, the capital B. So the capital B was the one which was dominant for the black B. Right. So capital B, that's the one which was the dominant. So that's the area for black color. So uh what was the genotype for the parent black bull so once you hear the term uh, pure breeding pure breeding goes with uh, what we refer as the uh, homozygous so if we're looking at uh, the homozygous genotype for pure breeding so we're looking for a, a black bull so this is both capitals so we have b and b so that's the genotype of that. So that is BB. Because we're looking at homozygous. Because that was a pure breed. Then the other one. Uh, using a genetic diagram. Show the resulting offspring. If the offspring black bull was crossed with the, the parent red cow. So now look at. We're looking at a cross between uh, a red cow and uh, one of the offsprings. So look at. Uh, the, the the parent the black bull this is the genotype of the black bull now you discover that the offsprings will be like this so so the offsprings will be like that so they will all be heterozygous so all the offsprings are going to be heterozygous black yes so this is so we're doing a cross between an offspring and um, a parent which was a pure breed so we're looking at uh, that one so here we have a hybrid here and we have one of the uh, parents so this is the cross that we're doing so what you're supposed to know is uh, so we're going to start so let's say what are the parents here so the parents is that uh, we are looking at a cross between a bull and a cow then i'm going to do the phenotypes so the phenotype the phenotype is a t uh the bull is black then the cow is red so we're looking at color then uh, the genotype now which is the genetic makeup So the genotype here we have said uh, one of the offsprings so now look at so 
So they're saying using a genetic diagram, show the resulting offspring if uh, show the resulting offspring if the offspring black bull was crossed with the parent red cow. All right. So now we're actually doing a cross with uh, with that. So this is what we're going to do. So an offspring. So this is uh, very important. So we're looking at uh, the cross between an uh, offspring black bull and with the parent red cow. So we have uh, this. And uh, we have uh, that there. Right. So now what we're going to do here is that uh, we're going to do the gametes. So after the genotypes, so what comes is uh, the gametes. So I'm going to do the gametes. So the gametes, so these genotypes are going to separate. So I'm going to have uh, like that. I'm going to have that. And I'm going to have that. And I'm going to have that. So this is what I'm going to have. Then from there, if you want, you can put them in circles or anything. It's fine. So I can say, I can put this in a circle, that in a circle, that in a circle, that in a circle. Then I can start crossing them. So now the cross will be as follows. So we are saying uh, this one is going to cross with the, that. Then this same one is going to cross with the, that. All right. Then e, this one is going to cross with the, that. This same one is going to cross with the, that. So when the, this and that crosses, so we're going to have something like this, B, B, All right? And when that Okay, so in that one, and uh, let's see, so in that one and uh, the other one crosses, so here we're going to have uh, that, that, then when uh, this and that crosses, we're going to have that, that, then when that and that one crosses, we're going to have uh, that and uh, that. Okay, so this is what we're going to have. So, this is the genotypes. So, for the F1 generation. So, this is the genotypes that we're going to have. For the F1 generation. Then, um, from, so genotypes. So I, okay, so this, just, uh, so we're saying, uh, genotype. So this is a genotype that we are having. Then the phenotype is that uh, we have uh, black, black, um, red, red. So we have black here. We have uh, black there. Then we have uh, red. Then we have uh, red there. Okay, so this is how you can uh, do this uh, cross. Then now, if you check out, there is another question which is saying, suggest what could happen uh, to the pure breeding uh, black bull or red cow to cause them to produce a black and white offspring. So what do you think would happen to those, since we're looking at pure breeds, eh? so what do you think would happen to cause them to produce a black and white offspring. So an important factor you should understand is uh, genes can be diluted. So what you can do is uh, when you do a gene dilution. So doing what we call a gene dilution, which will actually cause the genes to undergo mutation. Okay, so gene dilution will mutate. So the key here is uh, the gene dilution and the mutation. So this will mutate the gene. Okay, so uh, will mutate the gene. So causing them. 
so causing them to produce a black and a white a black and white offspring so causing them to produce a black and white offspring yeah so that is what can be done so when you do a gene mutation so that is actually what is going to cause uh, those so but apart from that it's very difficult they won't be able to have that mixer of black and white unless if we, uh, there is the mutation that has taken place all right okay so now we're going to end it here for this uh, paper then check out for another video that i'm going to make that will contain uh, questions for the other part which is part b the essay part and how you can answer them so this was the part where you, uh, you could answer these so hopefully you got one or two things so we'll end it here from uh, this one.